I would like uh, then to um, switch over to the agenda and use the time uh, to uh, present uh, the speakers. So first one, that's me, um, Markus Pistauer. I'm the CEO of CISC Semiconductor and manager of the uh, uh, project also uh, that, that's part of a, a joint activity um, between um, NXP, us, and uh, Graz University of Technology Department for um, Technical Informatics. And um, at the beginning, also a big thank you to Silicon Alps Cluster, um, where we are, and NXP are shareholders. It's a, it's a regional community um, that tries to uh, reach out to uh, policymakers, industry companies, um, and, and, and users in the, in the electronic-based systems area. So thanks for hosting this. The next speaker then will be Alexander Reich. He is uh, also from our company. He is a system engineer uh, and also a PhD candidate. Uh, he works in collaboration with Technical University Graz. Then we have Christian Lederer. He is our vice president, um, Embedded Systems. Um, the next one is then from NXP Franz Keiner. Uh, we had uh, the opportunity to, to work with him. He's team lead at um, NXP uh, Semiconductors here in Austria and in, in Gradkorn. Um, and then uh, we have also another speaker I didn't introduce yet, which is Michael Seifer. He's also from NXP and RF system engineer here. So I think um, in the meanwhile, everybody should have been arrived and um, I would like now to, to start this uh, webinar. So welcome again to all those folks who dropped in right now. We didn't start yet and uh, you didn't miss anything. So uh, let's jump into the agenda of the day. Uh, the welcome and introduction uh, I made already. Thank you for joining us. Um, you see here uh, the whole webinar is clustered um, in, in different uh, uh, sections. Um, a little bit uh, showing also the work uh, that we jointly did, which is an indicator of how good fits uh, things fit into each other. So there is one part coming from NXP, which is uh, mainly the, the, the chipset, the framework around, and the other part from our side this site that uh, takes this environment and brings it to an, an, an application, which is the topic of the entire uh, webinar. So the first section is the secure sensor data transfer from embedded to the, the cloud layer from Alexander Reich. Then we continue to uh, the next section that deals with the integration of uh, specific hardware or add-on uh, hardware based on the uh, plug-in sensor NHS3152 uh, and the hardware security um, I see from NXP semiconductors the SE050 um, and uh, also wireless charging on a small form factor which is from Christian Lederer. Then Franz Kreiner will talk about the key management uh, um, and the configuration of it um, taking the, the capabilities of uh, configuration of the SE 050 element, the key distribution, and then of course the framework, the edge lock, the go that's provided from NXP. Um, and at the end, we will conclude um, with um, three uh, different uh, topics uh, that all deal with software integration methodology and they differ on the different hardware platforms that we try to address. So one of them is a well known Raspberry Pi. The Arduino and Nordic chip and uh, Michael Salfer and NXP will provide the framework that's provided by NXP, how that can then be brought um, from theory to uh, practical implementations. At the end, there will be a question and answer section. Very important um, is for, for the entire um, webinar, some of the rules. I would like to ask you that you mute your microphone if you're not speaking. Um, put your phone on silent mode. Um, I forgot about this. I will do it. <laughs> um, speakers have the camera on. And then for the Q&A, um, we uh, will try to uh, collect all the questions um, if you're using the chat function of this tool. So file your questions over the chat. 
And, and we will then uh, collect all these questions and they will be answered at the end of the project at the Q&A section. So that's all about. And I'm happy now to hand over to Alex. He will present the secure sensor data transfer from embedded to the cloud layer. Please enjoy. Many thanks for the introduction and welcome from my side. In the course of the following slides, I will give you a broad overview of a project that is about end-to-end -end security. Different software and also hardware building blocks were utilized to meet this high-level requirement of end-to-end -end security. But first, let's talk about the general idea. The Internet of Things revolution is ongoing. That is nothing new. In fact, there is an exponential increase in the number of IoT devices and wireless connections around the globe. According to estimations, around 50 billion devices will be connected to the Internet by 2050. In the end, a lot of data will be exchanged. Therefore, secure and trusted communication becomes ever more important. Due to increased governmental surveillance or other topics such as data breaches of confidential data, for example, end-to-end -end security has recently received increasing attention as a way to protect against such threats. Summarized, end-to-end -end security preserves the confidentiality of data in a way that only specific authenticated participants have access to plaintext data, while all others may not access it, at least not in plaintext format. Mapping the idea of end-to-end -end security to a typical IoT data collection system results in the picture you see on the bottom. While edge nodes are data collectors, the gateway device acts as a cloud connector, forwarding the confidential data to a central server. There, it can be analyzed and monitored. The goal is that data coming from the edge node can only be read by the server and by nobody else, not by the gateway and not by any other device. This is achieved via encryption mechanisms and by ensuring authenticity between our communication participants. How exactly? We will see in the following slides. Now, let's take a closer look at each entity of our demo system, taking the basic system of the previous slide as a starting point. We split our devices into two layers, an embedded and a cloud layer. The primary task of the edge node is to measure sensory data in constant intervals. For example, temperature and humidity once a minute. Other tasks include the processing of this data. In this sense, the raw data package is merged with additional information identifying the sensor, the measurement type and a package number, for instance, in order to mitigate man in the middle attacks. More complex or energy-consuming tasks have to be outsourced to other devices. Since sensor nodes in typical IoT systems, also in our case, run on battery. This means there are limits regarding power and computational resources. That is the reason why the edge node cannot directly connect to the Internet and uses a local wireless communication interface instead to talk to the gateway. More on this later. Our next device is the gateway used as a connecting unit between sensor nodes and the cloud layer. The gateway's job is to establish a local connection to every available sensor node and to receive the encrypted data from them. Subsequently, the data gets repackaged in order to be sent to the server on the cloud layer. Since the gateway is in the middle, it needs to support local and online communication channels. Additionally, Bidirectional communication is required in order to be able to receive messages from the server, in our case for warnings or errors. Regarding the cloud layer, the business server is the direct point of contact for the gateway device and receives the secure data packages. Next to our sensors, it is the second anchor of trust in our end-to-end -end communication, meaning that it can decrypt to receive data. Furthermore, it may provide an interface for other server applications. This would be the third-party cloud, or the analytic server, which can be operated by an external service provider, 
So somebody who wants to access a specific data stream and execute some operations on it. The received raw data can be used for new tasks or for enhancing already existing ones. Examples of different techniques include statistical modeling, data mining, analysis tasks or diagnostic methods in general. However, the analytics server does not necessarily have to be an external unit. It can also be part of the same cloud environment as the business server or just be a different endpoint. A summary of our security considerations is displayed on this slide. On the right side you see also the overall architecture. Depending on the security requirements of the underlying application, different provisioning approaches are possible, so different ways on how to get cryptographic material on your device. In our case, we chose a provisioning procedure through the OEM, which is the entity that provides and manages the business server and the edge nodes. In our case, an RSA key pair is generated by the OEM and the corresponding public key is transferred into the edge node. Next to this method, there also exist different provisioning approaches involving the secure element provider. We'll hear more about this afterwards during the part of Franz Greiner from NXP. After the provisioning, we differ between the application and transport layer security. Regarding encryption on our application layer, you could use the asymmetric pre-injected RSA key to encrypt data on the edge node and decrypt it on the business server. While this would be enough for applications with low performance and memory demands, the more scalable and secure solution foresees the usage of symmetric session keys, for example. They can be exchanged through asymmetric key wrapping or, for example, a diffie hellman key exchange procedure. By contrast, on the transport layer, Bluetooth Fly Energy is used between sensor node and the gateway. The edge node in this case is the peripheral device that advertises its presence and provides data. The gateway instead scans for available sensors and reads the data after connecting to them. The data transfer itself is secured via Bluetooth Fly Energy's link layer data signing, which enforces the authenticity of sensor node and gateway. Complementary to this, the gateway interacts with the server over HTTP TLS, or to be more precise, mutual TLS. This ensures not only an additional encryption layer, but also authenticity for the gateway and the server. If you look at the right picture, you may also see that the edge nodes and the gateway were equipped with secure elements. But to be more precise, it was the secure element SE050 from NXP. This is a very important sub-module of the project. In our case, it handles all the encryption, key handling and key pair generation while also providing secure random generated numbers. Just to name a few examples, we use the secure element on the edge node for storing our RSA long-term key, as well as the pass key secret for our Bluetooth Low Energy link layer security. Additionally, the secure element could also be used as hardware-based random number generator. And last but not least, to generate and store short-term keys. On the gateway side, we used it for injecting and retrieving certificates and also as random number generator. Last but not least, the following picture depicts an overview of the implemented system on the embedded layer. On the right side, you can see the edge nodes, while on the left side, the gateway is displayed. These are Raspberry Pi controllers equipped with the SA050 breakout board and additional temperature and humidity sensors. We will hear more about the Raspberry Pi and SE050 integration later. Summarized, an overview about a multi-layered IoT data collection system was given that enables secure data aggregation and exchange from the embedded layer up to the cloud level. End-to-end -end secure communication was realized with the help of the secure element SE050. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Alex. 
Um, I will not put on my video as I have seen there might be some bandwidth issues. So you still have to uh, take advantage out of my avatar. <laughs> and I hand over now to Christian. Um, he will speak about uh, the integration um, of this um, hardware add on plugin sensor, the NHS. 3152 and the hardware security device, the SA050, um, and wireless charging uh, used for small form factors. So, Christian, if you give a try with the video, if you figure out uh, that the audio gets uh, bad also on your side, we will turn you off from the video. <laughs> okay. okay, sorry all for, for, that, for that hurdles, um, and we hope that will now will work out better. Good. The floor is yours, Christian. Okay, thank you, Markus. Hello, everybody. Um, I will turn out my video immediately to avoid the problem. So you can see me now. Hello. And from now on, unfortunately, you cannot see me anymore. But anyways, um, to have a good audio quality, I think is, is the better solution. So my part will now be um, to talk about the more hardware related stuff. So what was the starting point here? The starting point was that we had an existing sensor, which was uh, a Bluetooth sensor and used energy harvesting. So had a very limited energy budget. This was the first problem. And the second problem was that the size of the sensor was quite restricted. So the sensor exists already or existed already and there were already two PCBs in one housing. On each side of the housing there was a PCB. So the only space left was um, some space in the middle. So we designed a very small and very thin PCB with all the elements we required. And for having the NFC functionality, we decided for a flexible antenna which we bound over an existing PCB to reach uh, one side of the housing that we could do the energy transfer and the communication via NFC. So what was it used for? Basically, um, the sensor itself is a very generic sensor. So you can connect, for example, a temperature probe or a pressure probe or something else on it and the sensor itself does not know what he is doing at the moment. So there needs to be a functionality to tell the sensor what kind of sensor it is, how, what is the accuracy, how is the calibration data of the sensor and things like this. So um, therefore we had the NFC link. We can tell the sensor using so-called TETs, these are transconductor electronic data sheets, um, what kind of sensor it is. So like a temperature sensor with a specific um, accuracy and also give the sensor the information about its calibration or about the calibration of the probe which is connected to it. This was one part which was um, executed over the NFC link. The other thing was the enrollment into an existing infrastructure. Imagine um, you have an, an infrastructure with um, several hundred sensors. There is a, a measurement control server and you have to add a new sensor in, in this infrastructure. In our case, we had just to put the sensor on the NFC um, on the NFC gateway and the gateway passed the information of the sensor on the one hand to the system, so the unique ID to the system and gave the sensor the information what it is via this electronic data sheets. And at the same point in time, um, the sensor gets its um, energy because it had um, a super cap and we used the NFC link also to charge the sensor within this time where the sensor got the calibration data and the system got the information from the sensor. And for sure, since we had um, an established link via NFC, we used the, um, the possibility to make a key exchange and uh, exchange symmetric keys 
between the sensor and the measurement system, like um, Alex already told you, um, to have then a very efficient um, encryption. And for sure, we used also the SA050 not only for encryption and for um, key handling, but also for hashing and for signing the measurements to avoid um, kind of um, introduction of wrong data in, in the measurement flow or any kind of, of manipulation. So. Good, now let's have a look at the block diagram. On the top of this diagram, you see more or less the energy path. So there's the antenna on the left side, the matching network. There is the H, uh, NHS3152, which is basically an NTEC. Then we have a rectifier and some filters. We have a wireless charging receiver, which is in our case um, a fixed voltage regulator providing five volts to the sensor. On the right part, there is This one is the, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I cannot draw here, but uh, on the right side, you see the already existing sensor. And we decided here for fixed voltage regulator because the sensor had a super cap. If um, you have a sensor with a, a lithium ion battery or something like this, you can um, choose the PCA4930, which is basically uh, a charging controller giving the energy to the sensor. So on the lower side, you can see the secure element here, which is now, um, which is also part of this sensor add-on board. And to limit the energy consumption, of the whole part and to avoid that this uh, sensor add-on board drains energy uh, from the sensor. Um, we had several mechanisms to avoid this. First of all, um, we used the sleep and deep sleep capabilities of the secure element. We only turned on the NTAC and the wireless charging receiver when there was an active NFC field. And there was an additional load switch to cut off the supply from the sensor at on board completely. So that means also the pull up resistors and, and stuff like this got um, disconnected. And for sure, there was a buffer in the I2C lines um, to avoid that in case only the secure element is active, um, that the NTEC and the wireless charge or receiver got uh, re reversed power uh, powered by the pull-up resistors on the R squares, uh, I square C lines. So, yeah, here, I think what I already said, but just for completeness. <clears throat> So then here's some measurements. So the whole system was tuned uh, for a load of 50 ohms. Um, and you can see here, we changed this load in a specific range and checked if the communication was okay. And you can for completely see here also the efficiency of the power transfer. The system was um, tuned to give an output voltage of five volts and half a watt and the whole thing was um, tuned for distance between the NFC reader and the NFC tag of seven, uh, seven millimeters with, which was the thickness of, of the housing of the sensor and the housing of the gateway. So and just if someone asked what kind of um, NFC reader we took for this setup, so we took our basically IoT gateway. Um, you can see 
on the top left, this is the main board. Below it, there is a daughter board, which um, basically hosts the NFC part and the NFC reader, which is a PN7362. And just for completely, uh, completeness, the whole thing, or well, the main CPU of this gateway was an i.mx6 with uh, Yocto Linux running on it. It provides um, Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth and for smart home applications, a SIGBee and the Z-Wave interface. So thank you, Christian, so. for this nice uh, introduction. Just a, a short comment from us. You saw the Coyero logo, the Coyero brand, which is a, is a brand from CISC Semiconductor. So that don't get confused um, about the us. So that's still part of, of our work here. So I'm happy now to hand over to Franz. He will um, talk more now in detail about the SE050 uh, capabilities and the framework around dealing with the key management and the configuration of it. Franz, please go ahead and talk about interesting stuff. Okay, guys, thanks for, for letting me know that <laughs> Franz dropped out. I was so focused on uh these technical issues that I, I missed that um so franz if you can uh, continue let us know and and um please go ahead with your presentation so uh, hello can you guys hear me again still not yes we can hear you ah, okay super yeah i needed to completely rejoin sorry for that guys we have technical issues today it's the show effect Okay, so I try to, um, I will not turn on the, the video, not even for saying hello, um, because I don't want to risk that. So, um, okay, I think, I think you can now hear me very clearly, I hope. Um, <clears throat> as we had quite uh, some technical issues also in the beginning, let me um, also resume a bit what we did in this, uh, in the project that Alex uh, nicely uh, prepared in the presentation, uh, but maybe some things were cut off. So. Uh, let me resume that. Uh, first of all, um, what was done, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so basically, we we have um, we have sensor uh, values, right, that we want to protect uh, security-wise for both um, being authentic as well as being confidential. Um, so, and this is true for multiple uh, sensor devices. This is why it's listed one to n, right? Uh, transported via the gateway which is on the one hand side uh, has the need to know if um, the sensor devices are authentic, right? But on the other hand side is not allowed uh, to look into uh, the application data, right? Just to make it clear again, Alexander has nicely said it anyways, but just to repeat. Um, and on top, the gateway connects to the cloud, right? So uh, what all does this have to do with key management and key distribution? Well, um, you need to bring somehow confidential uh, key material on the uh, devices, right? This is true for both the sensor devices, uh, can be many, right, per gateway, as well as for the gateway itself. Um, the, the scheme that was presented, um, yeah, this is uh, differently called, but uh, we call it sometimes OAM-centric or OAM-based key distribution scheme, where basically the um, equipment manufacturers like the gateway provider as well as the sensor device providers, which can be different or often are different companies, actually push key material, right? Uh, and handle key material. Um, in the, in the uh, approach presented in the beginning, uh, this was true for both gateway and uh, sensor device sites. Um, so this is of course a flexible, simple and pragmatic approach that was used here. Um, we also saw that the security scheme uh, was a bit shaped to that already because, uh, for instance, on the uh, original application layer security uh, a concept, we have, for instance, an uh, asymmetric scheme uh, where the public key uh, is, is pushed on, on, on the sensor devices and the private corresponding key stays at the cloud provider, right? This might be uh, fully fine and this was in this use case very good but might not scale to all the use cases. So let's go uh, to the challenges that we have, right? From a security perspective, as well as from industrialization perspective. 
So first one would be that the cloud provider actually needs trust relationships to multiple OEMs and parties, right? Might not be a problem, but uh, might be also not uh, wishful, depending a bit on security uh, or certification um, requirements. Uh, and also business relationships, of course, right? Furthermore, the OEMs uh, need uh, secure environments and procedures for handling key material. Um, this is sometimes available uh, and of course, sometimes not, right? Also depending on the uh, level of security one wants to reach. Um, and most of all, and this is a bit more on the pragmatic side, um, the, uh, set, there is setup effort on OEM sites, right? To push material. You need to imagine that for instance, Sensor devices uh, could be also in the range of hundreds, right? One needs to set them up. Um, okay, uh, solutions to these uh, challenges. Um, there are multiple, which I will show, at least on a, on a high level. So um, the Edgelog universe itself uh, provides uh, solutions uh, for those challenges um, on, on different uh, scales, dependent on, on size, configuration, and customer wishes. And this is exactly what we're gonna dive into, right? So um, let's take a look on the base configurations. This is more uh, the base information because we will, we will uh, refer to that afterwards. Okay, the first configuration uh, here in use is the ready or ease of use configuration. Um, from the Moncage perspective, uh, this is actually, let's say the bare uh, SC050. Um, it's already pre-provisioned, die individually with uh, keys and certificates. Right, more to that comes than in a detailed slide, more for reference. This exists in uh, three variants, uh, SC050, A, B, and C, with different uh, uh, base cryptography uh, underneath, ECC, RSA, or a combo of both, and SC050C has on top uh, additional features, uh, not only from security perspective, but also, I think, from communication perspective. All right. Um, second configuration uh, would be a custom configuration, right? It's about um, custom provisioning of the edge lock SC050, tailored really to customer wishes. So um, one could imagine that you have a, a standard SC050 and then you shape it really uh, as the customer wants. This, mean, this, this means this is a dedicated um, um, product in the end with a dedicated uh, sales item to order. Um, it supports complex keys and certificate configurations fully to the customer wishes, of course, in the borders of the allowed um, um, configuration uh, parameters or uh, borders. Okay, device certificates are available for download. This is something uh, we're gonna check um, later on in a detailed slide how this works. Um, yeah, and, and there are different uh, terms and conditions uh, and minimum order quantity. Uh, available depending on project size, customer wishes, and uh, engagements. The third uh, option here is the so-called managed configuration uh, with Edge Lock to go, uh, with an uh, NXP a cloud service for managing the devices um, uh, in their during their lifetime. Roughly said, uh, one can add up that in revoked keys. Uh, how this maps to the use case we saw in Alexander's presentation, um, I will roughly show in, in the next slides. Um, yeah, and the idea here is, uh, despite having a generic um, uh, chip in front of you, S050, uh, still it can be tailored in the field or at setup phase to the customer wishes. All right, then um, let's talk uh, quickly about how this applies to the challenges we have seen before. So if one um, chooses the ease of use configuration, um, as we did also for the, uh, for the primary setup of the project uh, that we saw, uh, we use the generic type, uh, as I already say, said, um, and we uh, read out um, um, basically device certificates in this in this case and push, push them um, to the appropriate cloud provider. I always uh, imagine this like kind of whitelisting for, uh, for the cloud uh, provider to know which devices can actually uh, access and get access. Uh, subsequently, one could imagine that uh, depending on certification level and security level, uh, that one could push back keys uh, to gateway or sensor devices via the cloud provider directly. Um, it's a pragmatic solution um, and might be um, uh, sufficient uh, for some of the use cases, um, like the one we saw here uh, for the primary setup. If you want to go a step further and uh, customize and industrialize further, of course, the edge lock custom configuration comes into the game. Here, as we said already, uh, custom type of edge lock SC050. 
And the trick here is, of course, that all the key material uh, would be prepared. If you now think about the use case that Alexander presented to us, would mean that uh, application key material, so this um, uh, public uh, private key pair, or even symmetric key material, symmetric um, uh, shared secrets could be already pre pushed and pre set by NXP in this case, and all done at NXP Secure Manufacturing. And the third option, right, if you think on the right side of the previous picture, we have the managed configuration, meaning generic type of edge lock SC050 and the edge lock to go. With the help of edge lock to go, we would do a managed onboarding to the actual cloud provider. So edge lock to go uh, only under quotes being used at setup phase. And afterwards, um, or during the setup phase, uh, one could also do remote management of keys, pushing even ap the application keys, if you think about the use case, um, down to the devices um, as wished. So this is, a, yeah, I would say an, an intermediate between the custom configuration and the ease of use configuration, one could imagine. Okay, um, let's look a bit deeper. This is more for, um, for our reference. Mm. So um, the different uh, edge lock uh, base configurations uh, from uh, hardware level SC050, A, B, and C. Um, yeah, as I said already before, uh, ECC, RSA, or a combination of both. Um, and this is all pre-configured, nothing to do, right? What is important to say is that um, that it can be used or not, right? As we saw before in the in the primary setup phase of the project, we, for instance, chose uh, to set own key material and own device uh, device certificates, which is also fully fine, yeah, depending on the use case. But here we would use the preset one and pre-configured one. Okay, I think the rest is more for reading for reading material. Um, how would this then uh, work with uh, different cloud providers? Um, as um, as said before, we would use uh, the individual device certificates uh, for registering at the cloud providers. Uh, and here are a few uh, famous cloud providers where this works uh, with uh, references to our um, setup um, um, application nodes, basically. Uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, Azure IoT Hub, uh, Google Cloud, IBM Watson, and AWS uh, Decor. So um, quite famous cloud providers. Uh, which allow such an uh, individual device certificate regi registration uh, without an intermediate CA, to my knowledge. All right, so this is edge lock ready configuration. Um, now, a deeper look in the custom configuration, and this is where I originally also come from, uh, from my job um, site, so to speak. Um, here, the um, the uh, the, OA, the um, uh, chip provider NXP. Uh, I wanted to say, if you look at the picture, injects the um, OEM keys uh, at secure manufacturing, so everything uh, prepared yeah, to the customer wishes. The trust relationship uh, in our use case before would be between uh, more between NXP and the cloud provider. In this case, of course, with the allowance of um, of putting uh, the key material. Um, uh, to the SC050. This is the lower part of the picture. And on top, uh, wherever needed, yeah, either um, device certificates um, or um, also symmetric uh, key material in some cases can be downloaded uh, from NXP via the key delivery service, uh, which is part of the Edge Lock to Go universe. Okay, looking quickly at the uh, key benefits as listed, uh, of course, security. Right, uh, our key pillar in, in the company, uh, keys are injected um, um, in NXP, yeah, in the NXP secure environment. And the big uh, bonus point here is it's a common criteria certified environment uh, with a very, very high um, uh, security level and certification level. Um, everything pushed there and every communication outside uh, of crypto material in any sense, which needs to be either uh, um, confidential or at least authentic in case of uh, certificates is always done uh, encrypted yeah? or sec with security awareness, let's say. Um, yeah, from personalization perspective, uh, one can configure as many credentials as one needs. Yeah? As we said already before, key pairs, secret keys, certificates, secure data, uh, and, and other configuration that you want to have preset. Um, 
What is also good uh, from flexibility perspective, uh, NXP can generate the keys uh, or also import uh, existing keys yeah? to also uh, be able to adapt firstly to customer wishes, secondly to maybe uh, existing infrastructures where keys are already in place. So import is also possible. Yeah. Um, okay, this is the custom configuration. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, the edge lock managed configuration, very important. Um, here, uh, a simplified picture, of course, um, saying that um, basically in the first step after uh, uh, getting contact to, uh, from the from the SC050 over the IoT device, um, that it, it's integrated in to edge lock to go, then keys are issued, uh, keys and certificates are issued. Um, Basically, then and then as a second step to say a bit more in detail here is that that edge lock comes in can come into contact um, in an automatized way with uh, the cloud one uh, chooses as a cloud provider um, and pushes uh, uh, or registers uh, key material appropriately at the cloud server and, and then the next and last step would then be that the devices can securely onboard um, to the actual um, to the actual cloud, which is here called your services, right? So it's an enhancement, basically, uh, and of of um, of getting a secure cloud onboarding, and this is also the name of the use case. If you look in, into uh, um, uh, appropriate material in the web, also. Um, okay, very very quickly on the key benefits um, from security perspective. Um, yeah, of course, the end-to-end -end security is the main pillar. Uh, fully leveraging NXP security infrastructure. Um, and what is really good is that from the start, keys are diversified per device, right? So uh, this is also one of the key pillars. So um, if one device would leak in whatever sense, uh, key material um, for onboarding, others wouldn't be compromised, right? Um, zero touch, um, as we said, said before, from the uh, use case that Alexander showed, uh, also, um, we would have a way to, and this is the most important point here, uh, that no key or certificates are need to be handled by OAM and not set up, and that it's comparably easy to configure once um, the soft, uh, let's say the SS050 is integrated from software perspective. Uh, and this is exactly what will be shown now in the, in the next session, uh, in the next uh, part of the, uh, the webinar. Uh, how to integrate actually such an SC050 into an IoT device. Um, last but not least, the flexibility, uh, support of multiple uh, types of credentials, uh, different configurations uh, depending on the customer project. So it's uh, it's allowed to have different um, configurations on Edge Lock to go um, on how to register uh, devices, so which cloud is to be contacted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Exactly, and last but not least, which would be also important for uh, for the use cases presented, uh, it's also possible to renew or add credentials in the field, yeah, with a further contact uh, to edge lock to go. All right, um, that's it uh, from my side. I would like then to hand over. Uh, to the next speakers talking about the software integration methodologies uh, for SC050 on IoT devices. Thank you, Franz, for um, your nice talk and all the details you gave us. So I would encourage uh, also all the attendees of this webinar to file some questions using the chat functions. We received uh, already three. Uh, questions and we would be happy to receive more of them um, to give you the maximum um, feedback here and uh, make the maximum out of the time that you spend here with us. So next speaker is then Michael Salfer from NXP. He will then talk about uh, the general capabilities around the framework and then Alexander Reich and Christian Lederer will now then talk about the details how these uh, topics provided by NXP, all the software modules then are transferred to software that's running on different platforms. So Michael, please.
Go on. I see you on the video. That looks good that we have enough bandwidth. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. So let's see. Continue, yes. <laughs> then, yeah, <clears throat> that's the uh, stack what we provide. But uh, let's walk this uh, slide from the bottom. So on the bottom, you see the Edgelog SC50. So this is the thing what actually NXP provides as hardware, where we have uh, our secure crypto cocoa processors inside, our Java card operating system, and then the specific IoT applet, which actually then controls what kind of crypto you can do with this product. So this IoT applet contains in all the functionality which you want, uh, for and it also contains the keys, and you can set them either on your own or XP can set them like it was explained just before. Now, as you don't want to, of course, to implement all these commands on your own uh, in your code, uh, here we provide also then a quite comprehensive uh, software framework around it. And this is shown on the top. So that's the enablement package, which is uh, publicly available on the website. So if you go to xp.com slash SC050, you find there the various software packages. And it starts at the bottom with yes, this is the API, which actually connects to the SC050, which handles all the commands. But that's uh, not yet enough, because there comes on top then the next layer. The next layer is an interface to common libraries like, uh, you know, OpenSSL, you know, Embed TLS. So whenever you have uh, some systems where to open up TLS connection, most likely you use these libraries already. And here exactly this gets uh, enabled in the software package. So you can use TLS and just through these normal libraries and we provide then uh, code which connects to these libraries which make use of our API and so the SEO 50 then. So Ember TLS and OpenSSL is quite well known. Uh, maybe Android Keymaster is less well known. That's the library which is used on Android. So if any uh, Android application makes use of crypto on an Android device, you can uh, use that uh, part here. And also here we have integration ready. So that even you can build up Android devices and an application works like before, but you can easily switch from software to hardware-based cryptography using this Android Keymaster. And uh, the last generic uh, interface available is a yeah, PKCS yes, 11 interface, uh, which is also, I think, quite well known, but less used as an MPTLS so OpenSSL. Now, these libraries usually enable the layers on top of it. I already mentioned TLS, uh, so transport layer security. So that's ne needed to encrypt the communication uh, towards web servers. And of course, they are also used uh, in all the cloud connectivity examples. So Franz just showed before the, all the major cloud vendors, they are enabled via examples. And uh, these examples then use TLS connection plus as its IoT, here also MQTT is always a big topic. So these examples contain an also an MQTT client to showcase then the whole communication stack. So you can send, actually you can post uh, MQTT messages towards an authenticated TLS channel uh, to, for example, to Amazon or to Google Cloud. So that's is, this means the, the application what you have most likely you don't need to change a lot because you still can use your standard libraries, which you already know. And it's quite transparent. It's just for uh, specific things like, okay, if you like, for example, to inject the keys, that's something which is not possible on libraries like OpenSSL, then you still need to access the API directly, which is shown on the left side. Now on the right bottom, you see uh, that this uh, software enablement is running actually on many platforms. So uh, first, let's see on the Idle Mix 6 well or 8M. So that's our default platforms uh, where it compiles right out of the box. So Linux-based platforms. Uh, Hikey 960 is our reference platform for Android integration. That's also what is used by Google. So if you go for this open source Android build, then usually uh, this builds by default on this Hikey 960 system. 
and of course also Raspberry Pi yeah as a popular Linux system is uh, supported and um, you see that what is needed to get to it running on that platform for that we have provides this multi-platform zip file uh, available on the website and that's an, a CMAC based build system behind which enables builds on Linux and on uh, Android. MCUs, uh, of course, are quite different because here's an uh, size usually matters. So you need to be small and you need to use uh, libraries like MBTLS instead of OpenSSL. And also CMake is not the build system, which is usually well known in uh, MCU embedded development. So here we support out of the box, uh, out of Nixa T1050, and Freedom K64F and LPC55. And here we provide ready-made SDKs. So on MCUs, you maybe usually you're used to, you just you go to your ED, you to your toolchain, you import uh, the MCU specific SDK, and then you can select the examples which you like to build. And that is what is enabled here. So here we have uh, SCO50 specific SDKs also available on this address, uh, nxpd.com slash SCO50. Um, which you can simply import, compile, and run. And this is then usually also the starting point for any kind of porting activities to other microcontrollers. So for this porting, we also have some uh, an, uh, porting guide available to port it to a kind of MCU, so which APIs are actually important, which are hardware specific. Now, after this overview, a uh, short, little bit deeper look into, okay, what is this stack of software what we provide here. And here now on the right side, you see that you have studio example use cases and on the Arthur's case, you use usually embed TLS. There's then the glue code between uh, embed TLS and triple S API is the so-called alt code or alternative implementation. That's a way of working on embed TLS to connect uh, to cryptographic hardware. And you see this triple S API as large block uh, in the middle, which is then um, the secure subsystem. So that is a quite generic API, which not only then enables the SCO50, which is used in this case, but also other secure elements, or in general, uh, it is already extended to some MCUs available from NXP, or other, in general, other cryptographic hardware, and uh, also, for example, things like trust zone architectures, they also will in the future be usable then through this generic triple S API. And in our concrete configuration, we just leverage then, okay, so we can create gen sessions through the session manager. We have the SO50 middleware, which creates the commands so that you don't take care uh, for which API you actually need to send. And at the end, uh, there's a TIG equals one over SQC driver, which uh, creates the I2C frames, which need to be put on the I2C bus. And uh, yeah, on the left bottom, then you see these are these three SDKs uh, ready to be downloaded from the website. And to just to compare that now, the situation from, you see it on the MCU side, if I switch further now to Linux. On Linux, it looks like that. It's pretty much the same. You see just uh, on the top right, instead of MBTLS, we use OpenSSL. Uh, we use here now engine. On OpenSSL, it's called an engine, this plugin concept. And the rest of the stack actually is the same. Of course, on MCUs, before everything usually compiled into one big static uh, binary. Here on Linux, we, we are open to shared libraries. So the main middleware and the interface usually gets compiled together to a so-called uh, libss API software. And on top then comes the libss engine as OpenSSL plugin. Of course, you can, you don't need to use OpenSSL. You can still call directly libss API. So it's always possible. And uh, the enablement, what we have here is, you see on the left then, uh, the zip file, which contains this, all the source code uh, with the CMake based build system, which enables this build on Linux and Android mainly, but you can also build for my controllers if you want. But I always would recommend if you build, uh, if you want to work with my controllers, please download these specific SDKs and start working with them. And uh, in case you have an Adamix uh, 6 well ready, 
Then here we all have also a ready-made SD card image. Just copy it on it in SD card, you start, and you have all the binary source code available to get communicating with the SEO50. Okay, that's it. What you wanted to tell here. Thank you very much, um, Michael. And the next presenter now um, will be um, Alexander, who will talk about the integration now on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, hello again. This time I will not take any risk and stay with audio only. <laughs> Hope it works better. Anyway, um, the system that was um, presented to you during the first minutes used Raspberry Pi as main controller together with a um, SE050 breakout board, which you can see also on the right side. And the basic connection between these two on hardware level uh, was established via the um, I2C interface. And to be more specific, the comments were wrapped using the smart card D1 over um, I2C protocol. But just look at the right side of the picture, you will see that the hardware integration between Raspberry Pi and the SA050 breaker board was quite simple. The only thing you need are four pins, power, so basically supply pins, ground pins, and the two pins you need for I2C. That's the whole magic behind the hardware aspects. Next um, would be the software aspects. And also here, thanks to the um, easy to use Agilog to go middleware, um, it was quite straightforward to integrate this element into the Raspberry Pi environment. So, but first of all, the primary software requirements you take into account um, are that you need Raspberry and OS or something similar installed on your Raspberry Pi. For example, Yocto OS would also work. Python is of great importance, as well as the CMake package. Last but not least, also the libssl library needs to be pre-installed on your Raspberry Pi. And if you uh, considered all of these software requirements, you can go to the next point and try out the EdgeLock SE050 Plugin Trust middleware. It's basically an SDK, which you can download directly from the NXP website and um, which is also filled with a lot of examples. The next thing is to check if the I2C interface is enabled, since the Raspberry Pi um, by default hasn't enabled it. The first thing to do is to check um, if it was already done or not. Anyway, check the availability of all of your I2C devices with a simple ls command, which is written on the slide. In case you see the secure element, everything is fine. Otherwise, you just need to activate it via the Raspi config command line tool. And last but not least, uh, you will be able to run different test examples um, consisting of symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, signing, and so on, certificate handling. So basically, a lot of different um, methods and functionality you need to build a secure application. Mm -hmm. So that's it from the Raspberry Pi side. Thank you, Alexander. Also, we think, I think we had a good audio this time. <coughs> and uh, we will now finish with uh, Christian's uh, slides about the integration on Arduino and the Nordic uh, chips. Christian, if you continue. Yeah. Hello again from my side. Uh, I want just to wrap up with some words here. So Michael already told you which kind of processors and which kind of microcontrollers are already supported. But um, as he told you that the integration of the SC050 is um, independent from the used architecture. I want just to give you two examples here, which are not in the portfolio of NXP. So we ported the, the library to an Arduino environment. And on the Arduino side, you can simply use embed TSL and as a hardware component, the SE050 is um, used without 
any additional um, interaction required. And the other example is a Nordic microcontroller and NRF52. There um, we use the SE050 as hardware accelerated backend, and it's kind of an additional so-called crypto backend in the Nordic environment, which you can use with the regular um, crypto front end. So from the application point of view, um, the whole method call stays the same. The whole methodology stays the same. So um, the effort to use the SEC050 as an hardware encryption component um, is quite low and you get the, this additional features of really hardware-based encryption. Good, thank you, Christian, uh, for these um, kind of remarks um, and the extensions uh, on the other uh, platforms. And we are entering now the Q&A section. Um, we have received um, already some some uh, questions, so thank you for for asking. Um, and we will uh, answer them to in the in the order of um, the time when we received the questions. So there were questions from Matthias on the LTK injection from Jakob uh, why we used the NSC uh, NSC from the SC didn't use the NSC from the SC050 from Roland about the target application also for uh, automotive. Um, then a question from Thomas regarding uh, under which license the plug and trust middleware is available. Um, have uh, posted that he has a question regarding uh, third party applet, uh, if this is possible on the SE050. And finally, Roland, um, with the second question, if there is a software stack already available for Forexworks. So I would like to start uh, with the first question from Matthias. Um, and he's uh, writing, is there a scheme for initial key provisioning, the LTK injection for symmetric uh, LTKs to avoid using asymmetric crypto for performance risks? Mm -hmm. so anybody here who is uh, willing to give an answer on that? Sure, I can. I can at least uh, start, uh, Markus. I think from, from my side. So, um, if we maybe, Markus, I, I navigated for a few slides back, right, to get a bit of graphical support. Perfect, perfect, perfect. I couldn't. Um, have it's not. It's not uh, too easy to answer. Yeah, but it's fine. <laughs> um, so basically, there um, there are multiple there are multiple ways. Yeah, I would say um, <clears throat> the ones ones that are decent, right? Uh, depending on the use case. So symmetric key material, um, as I tried to explain before, I would say are manageable. For instance, via the custom configuration, right? Which is uh, possible uh, starting from a certain volume, um, where you could uh, inject. Uh, whatever you you want, right? As we said in the borders of S zero fifty capabilities, uh, but basically in this way uh, you would um, you would also be able to provision um, symmetric long term uh, key material LTK. Um, and the second option is via um, um, remote um, remote um, a key management or remote trust provisioning, as we sometimes call it. Uh, via the managed configuration, where you would push key material via the already set up transport layer. Yeah, um, I would say those are the the options you have. Um, as correctly mentioned, um, uh, having uh, asymmetric key material for uh, for the setup, depending on the use case, of course it it takes time. Um, yeah, and might um, might uh, not be suitable. Uh, one thing that we need to add, this last point, is that um, very often it is done in two layers. You have an asymmetric uh, key material to exchange primary symmetric key material with which you do the actual communication, right? So as soon as it goes into bailout, you stop with asymmetric. Okay, okay. thank you so much. 
Um, yes, this is this is not a discussion round. Otherwise, we would spend too much on uh, on the topics and and lose the the, the other questions. So um, I hope that answered that correctly. If there's still some topics open, please just uh, put another question in the chat. And we continue with Jacobs. Uh, Jacob, uh, who asked why we did not use uh, NFC from the SA050? Why another IC? I think Christian can answer that. If he gets the micro working. <laughs> Christian? Oh, my microphone is on. Yes, you're on. So. Great. Okay, yes, I can answer this. So uh, the main reason was the power consumption. So um, the consumption of the NHS 3152 was lower and can, and um, there are some cases where you only need the SA 054 encryption and you don't want to power the uh, NFC part of this chip. And so you can reduce the power even more. This was one reason to, to choose this uh, architecture. And the other reason was the NHS 3152 um, is a very generic um, chip. So there's a Cortex M0 running on it and it's more flexible. So we have the flexibility to change the, the firmware there and we can simply um, do more than just um, a transparent link between the sensor and the gateway so we can change the firmware there and if we don't need the nfc functionality we can completely cut off the power supply of this chip and limit the energy consumption of the whole system good thank you christian there is another question the last one we received but it's related to this one so i would like to reorder um the answers um which means the question is what uh, is the se050 power down consumption so maybe you have that figure out of your brain or can you answer this i already commented it in the chat so for <laughs> okay <laughs> for a deep power down mode um the consumption is going down to three microamps and for the regular power down mode, it's around 40, uh, 430 microamps. Okay, great, great, great. So thank you. Uh, the next question is from Roland, um, who is um, referring to the um, product spec, uh, means uh, that the target application is smart cities, smart homes, smart industries, smart supply chains. The question is, is there a plan to include automotive applications? That would yeah. be very likely uh, a question for for our uh, either Michael or Franz. Yeah, so uh, here for, for automotive, usually if you would like to enter the automotive market, you need some specific uh, automotive qualification steps, which uh, the SEO 50 in this case does not have. But still, yeah, we have seen there is quite some interest also on the automotive market. And actually, yeah, say an automotive, at least customers who accept that here is no ready-made automotive qualification done, they will use it. So, yes, it gets extended to that market as well, but uh, only in a limited scope. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next question is coming from Thomas, who is asking under which license the plug and trust middleware is available. Yeah, so that's uh, it's a conglomerate first of, of licenses. Uh, but uh, let's start with the easy thing. Everything is delivered in source and everybody is allowed to modify it up to his, his needs. So parts of it is on a BSD, parts are on Apache, or even other uh, open source licenses. And uh, then other parts are under proprietary NXP license, but also this license, this NXP Euler allows you uh, to get the full source code modified to your own and distribute then the resulting binary towards uh, your customers. Uh, we also have the plan here to have the, the, the minimum set 
of the middleware which is needed uh, we will place it then uh, now in not too distant future so I expect some weeks uh, on github then under an BSD license but the, as the middleware itself is quite large we cannot avoid for the complete set to have it covered with different licenses mm -hmm. okay so thank you for this comprehensive and interesting feedback that makes the device even more attractive i would say um the next uh, and and the uh, before last question is is uh, uh, coming from herf who is asking um third party applets possible on the se050 so here uh i have to say sally no not yet uh so it will be in the future but not yet so this year then okay and the final question if there are no other questions drop in is from roland again um he's asking if a software stack is uh, ready available for the v, uh, vx works uh, no sorry so he is uh, no pre-integration done by nxp yet okay 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 good so um I appreciate it um, that uh, so many people uh, dialed in and had the chance to listen. Um, I would like to uh, thank um, all the speakers uh, of this webinar, um, also the attendees uh, for their interesting questions um, and also their interest. And um, I would like also to thank you Silicon Alps Cluster for the promotion of these actions and for providing the Webinar Infrastructure, they are partner in our Steve project uh, together with CISC, NXP and uh, TU Graz. And um, then there is um, also an acknowledgement to uh, funding authorities uh, that have funded part of that work uh, that has been uh, presented here. So before I um, finish, um, we still have some time. There is another question regarding certifications available uh, or plans such ISO IEC uh, 27001 or ISO SAE, this is the, the uh, Automotive 21434. Uh, Somebody who can answer that question? Maybe Michael? Sorry, which was the uh, exact? Standard? Yeah, there are some certifications available. Means for ISO IEC uh, 27001 or ISO SAE 21434. Uh, so, uh, I think this one um, first uh, quality and safety, maybe. So, here there is uh, no uh, certification available. There is, uh, for example, 62443, which is an, uh, also a kind of generic security certification. Uh, this will be uh, available, at least as help, for people how they can get their certification done. And apart from that, uh, CIC yeah, is certified according to CCC standards. So at least the, the hardware and the OS is certified according to CCEL 6+. Good. So thank you, everybody. Just a final hint, you will find, um, of course, the presentation and the recording for download at um, our partner Silicon Alps, which is www.silicon-alps.at slash news. Um, I'm not sure if you, uh, if you get emails on that, but um, I think yes. Um, that will uh, give you the access to, to the presentations and also to the recorded uh, webinar that, that we did uh, today. So thank you for everybody listening, contributing, and I hope to see you soon uh, next time our next webinars. Thank you and goodbye.